one of the most important ways in which this this town and this institution has changed since you first came here? Well, I'm not sure it's all good. Um, I think that uh, uh, the generation and the era of Bob Dole uh, and his colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, was a better time. I'm not a uh, you know naysayer or pessimist about uh, the future. I'm always hopeful, but I do think that uh, modern technology and 24/7 news and instant communication and uh, airline travel and now members go home almost every week many of them leave their families back home. It has uh, contributed to a less congenial, uh, less cooperative, uh, less friendly atmosphere. Everything's partisan and got you. And, um, and that has infected the institution some. And the high Senate, you know, was designed not to move cleanly and smoothly and quickly. And you add that on top, it makes doing things very difficult. But uh, in spite of it, every now and then, uh, the American people people, uh, including their representatives in Congress, uh, rise to the occasion and do something, uh, as uh, Senator McCain would say, greater than themselves. This is a project obviously about Bob Dole, but more yeah. than Bob Dole. I mean, uh, Dole's career in a lot of ways is, is almost a microcosm yeah. for the transformation yeah. of the Senate, the Republican Party, conservatism, right. and, and you, in reading your book, you know, you, you in many ways do represent kind of a, a shift uh, generationally. Uh, geographically, uh, to some degree culturally, ideologically, where the Republican Party mm -hmm. has moved over the last oh, yeah. 30 years. Did that make for uh, pretension? Well, perhaps so. Uh, I started to say years ago, way back in the 70s, to my Republican colleagues in uh, New England and the Midwest, just hold the line. Uh, you know, we're going to build a majority from the South. We're going to begin to pick up House and Senate seats in the South on a regular basis, and, and that will move us into majority, coupled with what we already had, and which grew some even in the West. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so I do think that uh, the uh, the base of the power of party has shifted uh, more southern and western. Um, I do think it is uh, probably more conservative than it was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but um, I have found also over the years that I'm still conservative and still where I was, but a lot of people in America and in my own party have moved beyond me. And uh, so uh, times have changed. But Bob Dole, I think, is a classic representative of a magnificent period of history in America. He's the epitome of the greatest generation. I mean, uh, his age and, you know, his uh, high school athleticism, you know, sort of the, the belt buckle of America out there in, in Kansas, his service in the military, his injury, the painful recovery he went through, uh, how I think that contributed to his determination and his work ethic uh, to try to do things for his uh, people and for his country. And it led him to uh, become, I think, a, a magnificent uh, member of the legislature, starting off in the Senate, uh, uh, jocularly known as the sheriff. He would patrol the back uh, bench, and if somebody unfairly attacked uh, then President Nixon, he would uh, you know, jump into the breach and, and uh, begin uh, a defense. And that led him on to powerful positions in the Senate, chairman of the Finance Committee and, and majority leader. And he was unique in that role, too. Uh, in a way, he sort of created that modern role, but I do think that role now has has changed even more. But, uh, you know, I think America owes a debt of gratitude to that generation, our fathers and grandfathers now, and our uncles who served in World War II, a lot of them, and did so much to build and change and prove this country. And I, the question is, and I've always asked this question, are we going to accept the baton from that generation and uh, carry it forward? Uh, we are, in a way, but not in many ways that we should. He, he clearly evolved. I mean, conservatives right. hate the word grow because yeah. they always equate it with moving left. Now that's right. You know, he grew it off. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, but, yeah. I've been accused of that myself. Well, okay. See, when you get in a leadership position like Bob did and like I did, uh, you, you know, you still have your same philosophy. You still have your ideology, but 
you also have to come to terms with the fact that you're not a dictator. You are the leader and you're charged with the responsibility not only of leading your party in, in one uh, body of the Congress, but in finding a way to get things done, which means you have to work with moderates and liberals and you know Democrats and everybody, and conservatives certainly, to shape uh, a consensus or a way to get to an agreement uh, that is good for the country. And uh, Bob uh, was good at doing that. Uh, you ha if you're going to be a successful leader, you have to learn to do it. And the minute you do, your friends uh, that share your philosophy or from your region will then say, what happened, you know, and they'll start attacking you. Is pragmatism a dirty word? In, uh, it, some, in, in some in some uh, areas. Now, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not a total uh, pragmatist. I am, uh, and Bob too. I think I, there is a, a grain of populism in me, but also uh, I think it's a genetic part of my body to want to get things done. Why would you want to come to Washington D.C. for heaven's sake? And, and live and serve in the Senate if you're not going to get anything done. When you could be living back home, better life, making more money, more time with your family. You have to really want to be here and want to get something done. If you're in the Senate as a job or just to survive, man, I feel sorry for you. Well, that, that, that's fascinating because as, as the conservative movement has evolved and grown in many ways, yeah. you know, there is this libertarian streak. Here. Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and I'm wondering about the, the, the conflict. There are a lot of Republicans who basically believe that government is the problem. So how do you become the party of government if at the same time you really harbor those profound suspicions about Well, it is a, it is a conundrum in a way. Uh, but I'm not a libertarian. I do think there is a role for the government, and if it's not what it should be, then we ought to do something about it. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I do think government, uh, you know, is not effective, not efficient, doesn't, you know, bureaucracy is not good, it's hard to make them function properly, uh, but, uh, and I think government tries to do way too much. I mean, I still hew to that same basic philosophy. I still believe that the, uh, the best government is the least government closest to the people. I still believe the private enterprise will always do a better job than FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Administration. I think, uh, you know, agriculture policy uh, or that's run out of Washington, D.C. probably doesn't relate a lot of times to the Kansas uh, wheat grower or the Mississippi cotton planter. So, uh, yeah, I still have, I have that strain in me. Uh, but I've also been uh, reading a book uh, recently I find quite interesting, but maybe because of my background, but because of what it says. The title of it is How the Scots Invented the Modern World. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and study the history of, of Scots and what they did for the world, uh, one of the things they did, David Hume and others, talked about, uh, you know, the human nature, uh, passions, you're inclined to have your passions override your good judgment, uh, the bad is a very powerful force, and one of the ways you control that is you begin to have a rule of law. You have a government that says, no, wait a minute, you can't rape somebody, you can't steal somebody's property, you can't just shoot somebody if you're getting uh, angry at them, and you've got to have some entity that uh, brings order to man and to society. Now, the problem is when that government, become, you know, wants to become too powerful and starts trying to dictate and uh, take and give uh, too many things. So there's a, there's a delicate balance there. But that is the uniqueness of uh, our uh, American form of government. Um, I think about it a lot, that we don't take an oath to the people. We don't take an oath to some particular leader. We take an oath to Constitution. We take an oath to support and defend a set of principles and ideals, unique in the history of mankind. And uh, we should, you know, be careful how we do that. Both you and the senator have served, of course, uh, apprenticeships in a central right. house mm -hmm. before you come into the Senate. What's the difference between the two, and why do so many members of the former want to join the latter? I don't. I don't think they're uh, associated in any way. Uh, probably are from two different worlds, uh, and uh, there's no comparison mm -hmm. between the House and the Senate. They're just totally different animals. Now, our forefathers once again exhibited their brilliance. I think with how they set it up and the, the compromise that led to uh, each state having two senators regardless of population and the House with the you know, representatives reflecting the population. But the House is, is just so different. First of all, 435 is like an anthill. 
they're you know they're crawling all over the hill they're younger uh, generally uh, more energetic and sometimes more passionate you know a lot quicker to fire off on a subject or react to what the people are saying to them uh, I like the house because I like its youth and vigor uh, but I also like order uh, I like the rules committee now if you're in the minority you hate it but if you're trying to get something done you got to have in that size of a body you got to have some control of when things come up and how they're amended and how long you debate them the Senate is just the flip side of that messy disorganized uh, rules are made to be broken uh, you know, anybody can offer any amendment on any subject anytime it's total chaos and it is the cooling off place you know uh, it was designed to be and has become uh, a, almost impossible a place to get to produce a positive result so the saucer which cools off the cup the hot cup of coffee has, I think has become a, a wash pan it's huge uh, but uh, you know they're very different obviously you can do more if you're in the Senate uh, you know you are representing a whole state and in some ways represent the country more than a Congress but not that, to diminish the Congress that tend to make you more if you will pragmatic as opposed to representing a particular district well either I, I, don't or know that I, or other I don't know if I'd want to call it pragmatic but yeah. you're more realistic now, one of the uh, things that I learned uh, slowly at first and then uh, very very quickly uh, was the how much more time you spend on foreign and defense and intelligence and international issues because of what's in the Constitution we're the ones that approve treaties we're the ones that confirm uh, you know the appointees and, and we really do pay particular attention to you know military appointees or defense and Secretary of State and things of that nature and uh, you know so we are in effect forced to spend more time uh, looking at the international ramifications of what we do. Uh, when I became leader, when I succeeded Bob Dole, even though I had come up through the chairs, you know, had been in two leadership positions in the House, had been in two leadership positions in the Senate before I became his successor as majority leader, when I got in that leader's office, I was stunned by how much more time I had to spend on getting intelligence briefings and, and dealing with international issues and trade issues and uh, every you know leader country's leader that would come to town they, who do they want to see they want to see the president the secretary of the state uh, the speaker and the leader of the senate and and so and I first I you know I said I don't, I don't really want to do that you know uh, but then a couple of times it, it was very clear that I was causing some international disruptions here these people felt snubbed that uh, the majority leader of the Senate would not meet with them so you host these meetings and then you begin to get a feel for what's happening in Eastern Europe or in South America or in Asia and you, you look at the Andean area and you didn't even know there was such a thing and uh, so that clearly forces you I think to uh, come to terms with uh, uh, the impact of what we do here not only how it affects our constituents back home but uh, how it affects the world and our and uh, uh, our relationship with them so uh, it, it is a very different place I personally still prefer the house yeah. even though I've been in the Senate uh, you know a little longer now than I was in the house I was in the house 16 years um, you know I, I, I just uh, sometimes I just get very embarrassed that the Senate uh, slides off into uh, you know endless futile debate was that frustrating for Dole oh I'm sure it was uh, but I think he understood it maybe a little better and uh, adjusted to it uh, uh, quite well. But I do think it, even then it was better than it is now. As tough as it was, by the way, during the Nixon era and all that went on there and, and then being leader in the 80s, although I think, uh, or in the uh, uh, late 80s and 90s, I do think that that was kind of a, you know, the... Uh, the best era for Republicans in the, in the 80s with Reagan and the 90s with the majority and, and Bob sort of rode the tide or maybe he pushed the tide to that point and you know to the crest uh, when he became uh, majority leader and, and then ran for president and was our, our nominee. Well, you know, so few people understand how this place works and, and, and I've known Senator Dole for almost 30 years and worked with he and Mrs. Doe on their autobiography yeah. and still couldn't tell you in a paragraph what exactly he did 
you know, sort of behind the scenes to make the place work, to make a bill come together, to form a coalition, to diffuse a, a I mean, what were his strengths? Well, I think he, uh, he understood uh, the Senate as an institution, probably as, as well as anybody uh, I've known. Uh, and uh, some people, you know, say, well, Bob Bird is the, you know, yeah. the one that, that wrote the book on the Senate. But uh, Bob Dole, uh, I think, uh, he, you know, since he was prepared so thoroughly before he became leader, and he learned so much as chairman of the Finance Committee. Oh. See, that's where you learn to deal with the Richard Russell. Uh, who was chairman of finance when Bob was like, I guess, number two, and then uh, on the uh, Republican side. And then one day there was an election and Russell was a minority and Bob Dole was chairman. You, so he learned how to work with a guy like Richard Russell. Now, there are not many Democrats left, uh, like I mean, like Russell Long. Right, sure. Russell Long. Uh, there are not many Democrats left like Russell Long now, but uh, he learned the art of the compromise and the, uh, the beauty of the deal when you do something that is good for the people in terms of tax policy or uh, trade policy or in the case of Bob things he felt passionate about like the Americans with Disabilities Act and so sometime Bob's background in the defense area or his personal uh, you know, injuries transcended any partisan politics that uh, might have existed. Do you think there's a bit of a populist in him too? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, I think he was just the epitome of a, a Kansas uh, senator and the people from Kansas. He, he, was, uh, he was it, he defined it, he reflected it, uh, and uh, I think that's a great credit for him. How difficult was it for him, do you think? Uh, I mean, clearly you were part of the, for lack of a better word, kind of firebrands coming out of the house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Newt Gingrich, yeah. Zodipi, sure. all of that. Uh, there was a different sort of approach yeah. Yeah. to, to yeah. all of this. I mean, how different, and of course it came to a head in some ways, yeah. the government shut down uh, yeah. during the Clinton presidency. How, how did he handle that? He didn't like it. You know, he, he uh, had some uh, things to say about, uh, you know, the, I can't remember what name he called uh, the group. Uh, maybe it would have included me. Uh, so he had trouble, you know, with these young Turks, uh, the, you know, the blow dry haired guys coming out of the house, you know, from, uh, even though, I mean, he, he uh, you know, worked with Kemp. Uh, yeah. Jack Kemp, who was yeah. one of us, and there was Newt Gingrich and Carol Campbell and Jim Martin and a whole number of us that came over to the Senate from the House, and we, we slowly began to change the dynamics within the uh, Republican conference. When I first got here, the conference was kind of maybe moderate, uh, but uh, the group that came uh, bef right before me, like Phil Graham and John McCain, and some that came right after me, like Judd Gregg, and some that came with me, like Dan Coates of Indiana, we began to change the shape. Uh, uh, and the, uh, this, this, I think, became a lot of the strength of the Republicans in the Senate. Uh, but and so he did struggle with that, and 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 I think sometime uh, he wasn't sure about me, quite frankly. I mean, I did uh, defeat uh, his friend and the whip, Alan Simpson, a, a really great guy, by the way. But uh, that was part of the revolution that was building. And uh, tell me about that race, because I think again, people outside this institution have no idea. What, what a campaign like that is. Well, it's unique to the Senate. It's very personal. Uh, thank God for uh, secret ballots. <laughs> I won by one vote. Uh, Do but, people not always tell you the truth? Uh, and we are still human beings, yeah, and senators uh, are like everybody else. Uh, we change our mind, you know. It's not that they didn't tell the truth, it's just the circumstances changed. But I was the kind of the upstart, and Bob, understandably, he called me and said, you know, I've got to, I've got to support uh, Alan. He's been a, a friend, a loyal whip, and he doesn't deserve, uh, you know, to, to uh, be removed at this time. And uh, he worked very hard. In fact, I, I had. Uh, uh, I think I had like uh, 32 commitments on Thursday, but when the vote occurred, I think I had uh, 27. So he pulled off five votes for me over the, from me over the weekend. But I, I understood that. 
In fact, uh, I think it would have been out of character and maybe even inappropriate for him not to support uh, his, his whip. Uh, so then after that, I, I think he, uh, he wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. But uh, I was, you know, I had experience. I was whipped for eight years during the Reagan years in the House. I knew how to set up a whip organization. And that's what I did. I just systematically went about my business, set up a whip organization in uh, the form that I had learned from in the, in the House. And... Uh, began to do my work, and um, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't wait for Bob to say go do a whip check on this or that. I'd go do it, and then I would take my card with the results and give it to him. And at first, he'd take it and look at it, and thank you, stick it in his pocket, and uh, that was about it. But I think. I think I maybe talked about this in my book. I know I've told, uh, told this story that the day he left the Senate, he gave a beautiful speech, and this everybody in the institution obviously loved Bob Dole and wished him well, even though the Democrats, you know, didn't want him to be president. But they were very generous. Tom Daschle was very generous in his comments for Bob that day. And I walked down the steps of the uh, Capitol, the front of the Capitol there, down to where he was going to get in the limousine and, and drive off. And just before he got in the car, he said, Trent, you were a good whip. He got in the car and left. That was the only time he ever said that. So, uh, you know, Bob, Bob wasn't loquacious in terms of expressing emotions uh, or feelings, but uh, he was, at the same time, he was very sentimental. I've seen him get tears in his eyes many times. Uh, he, he, you know, he was really a very complex uh, person. Uh, Difficult and, to know? In a way, I mean, he's like a lot of us in Washington. We're uh, we're gar uh, garrulous and outgoing with crowds and the, the masses, but to get sometimes it's hard to get inside the shield and really get to know us. I, I, I'm a little bit that way. I mean, in my life, uh, I uh, you know, if you go back and look at my my background and where I was born and what I experienced in my young years, it's understandable. But not many people got inside the fence uh, with me. Uh, but I had, I have had a few really close, close, good friends over the years. I don't want to say that. It's not always that I want to know everybody a little and nobody very much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, high school friends, uh, my roommate from college, who's now a federal judge. Uh, you know, uh, we are very, very close to him, and you know, we've uh, sung together, played together, cried together, prayed together. Uh, and I think Bob is a little bit that way too. There are some people in Bob's life that you know he probably uh, would die for and uh, and but you know it's still uh, he's a very private in fact Alan Simpson again to his great credit after I uh, won that election he said I want you to come to my office I want to talk to you so I fine I'd be honored and uh, he was just so, so magnanimous so, and just a great guy and he is to this day obviously we sat down and he said okay you need to know more about Bob Dole and how you're going to work with him and he said, you need to understand that he is the leader, you're the whip, uh, and you got to remember he's an eagle. He's got huge wings, and he, he will overwhelm and, you know, dominate the process. You should be comfortable with that. Uh, you know, he won't praise you a lot. He won't ask a lot. But he'll appreciate it every time you stand with him and, and uh, go to battle with him. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a very nice thing for him to do and it was it was helpful to me in understanding uh, Bob Dole as the uh, majority leader in the Senate. Remember the day the um Senator Hatfield apparently actually offered to resign. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, I was the there. Yeah, Tell I might that. have talked about that in my book too, Herding Cats, which by the way, really is something that came from, I think I heard it the first time from Howard Baker, another majority leader, but I have make it, made it my own. You know, that's one of the things we do in the Senate. We have a, a hear something good, we take it as our own, we give no attribution. But uh, I had done my whip work on this constitutional amendment for a balanced budget very carefully. And Bob was, this is a case where he really was working with me and we were talking about you know where the Republicans were what Democrats might we get and what Democrats had been with us but were jumping ship on us this time and finally it boiled down late one afternoon maybe even the night I, I went to him and I said Bob I've worked this thing worked this thing worked this thing and uh, you have too and I'm here to tell you that if we get Mark Hatfield it passes if we don't it won't so and I've done all I can uh, it's up to you. So he asked Mark to come see him. Uh, 
and he went in the room there I stayed in the, out the ante room they went in there and stayed a good long while uh, I don't you know I don't know exactly what was said but uh, basically Bob put it to him that uh, it was all you know on his shoulders and that we he really wanted his vote and uh, of course Mark Hatfield said no uh, his principles uh, would not allow him to do that and he he would vote no but he would resign and his resignation vacating that seat would give us the win and of course Bob Dole turned it down I think that once again uh, reflected the men of that era Bob gave it his best shot persuaded him every way he could tried to uh, Mark Hatfield being who he was said no I'm not going to do it I don't think it's the right thing to do but I will resign if you are convinced that that's the right thing for the, the party in the country and then Bob Dole also correctly said absolutely not you know we'll win it or we'll lose it but we're we're not going to sacrifice you on this altar uh, and Bob came out and basically told me briefly what had happened and we went on we had the boat sure enough we lost by one boat and no hard feelings no you know I had Bob uh, uh, I, I developed some philosophy and some antidotes about how to be whip during my years in the house and uh, one of the, the things that I repeated often, often and I perhaps heard it from somebody else but basically it was that uh, uh, the most important vote is not the last vote but the next vote and every day leave your colleagues in such a way even though you'd fought them that day that you could come back to them the next day and say how about this yeah. you weren't with us then that was yesterday this is today how about that and uh, I also had a philosophy that uh, a New York Times reporter wrote a story about one time uh, that I called keeping them together by letting them stray uh, when you're, you know, you're trying to keep this herd of cats together um, and to produce results, as you go along, sometime uh, a, a congressman in that case or a senator has a particular problem in his or her district or his or her state, and they really can't be with you. But if you work it, you can let them go sometime so that when you do get to the really, really big one where it really does matter to the country, you can pull them back in and say, okay, you strayed, but now we got to all be together. And it worked well uh, during the 80s, and it worked in the Senate uh, quite often. It's a lot tougher in the Senate. Senators are a lot more elusive. Uh, first of all, senators, uh, have a lot of them have the ability to just not give you an answer. They'll listen, tell you how much they appreciate your thoughts. Uh, they'll, they'll think about it, and they won't give you an answer. Uh, the Senate, uh, the whip position, and the leader position uh, is you have to pay very close attention to body English. You have to learn to read senators. Uh, but basically, if you do it a while, and Bob Dole had that ability, uh, on any vote, he could probably tell you instantly how 50 of the 53 Republicans would vote. And there was usually, you know, half a dozen that would kind of swing around back and forth or you couldn't depend on necessarily or you couldn't expect them to just jump right in line. Uh, and you, you develop that, that instinct. Uh, and also you begin to uh, watch people and when they, they, they begin to go wobbly on you, you can pick it up. And Bob had a, you know, just a you know, fantastic uh, ability to do that. What are your tools, if any? The weapons? No, no, that's one of the weaknesses of uh, uh, the position of majority leader uh, in the Senate. Uh, first of all, it's not a constitutional position. Uh, you only, the only thing you have, the only power, is the power of persuasion and respect for the position. You have uh, no sticks, hardly at all, and al almost no carrots. There's not a lot you can do to a senator or for a senator. Now, if you really work at it, you develop a little, uh, you know, a, a little a box of tools you can use. Uh, you can freeze them out a little bit, or you can maybe assist them in maneuvering through the committee assignments, or maybe what I used when I was in the House. And remember, uh, I was the whip in the minority in the House, was I realized that uh, the best uh, tool I had, the best uh, uh, carrot I had, was the administration. I had the Reagan administration. So I became uh, the go-to shop for a local a congressman. Maybe you had a you know, second-term congressman from New York and he was having a problem with agriculture over the apple crop. 
Uh, so he would come to see me and then I could go to the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Butts, yeah. and say, now look here, uh, this Congress has got a problem here. You're not responding, you're not taking care of him, this is not unreasonable. You get a result. That is appreciated. So you can begin to build up uh, a certain amount of uh, currency that you can then use to get uh, 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 return favors or votes. You think the job will change significantly, say, since the legendary days of an LBJ? Oh, yeah, it's changed a lot. But there are a lot of similarities, too. Yeah. You know, uh, you know he, Lyndon Johnson was uh, bigger than life, very aggressive. If you treated senators today like he treated senators, uh, that would not work. Yeah. Uh, you can't intimidate senators or get up in their face and shout them down. Uh, Is it less party loyalty today than 50 years ago? I mean, less sense. I mean, tell I do. I do think, in a way, uh, there's there's some degree of less uh, party loyalty, um, and I think. Uh, probably, you know, the leadership roles are tougher. I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that the toughest job in this city is majority leader of the Senate, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, uh, because of the weakness of the, the powers that you have. The Speaker of the House has the Rules Committee, and uh, he or she can basically lay down the law. The President of the United States, he makes a decision, people move. <laughs> the majority leader of the Senate makes a decision, it goes to subcommittee. It is a tough job, uh, but it can be done if you have a, uh, you know, that's, you have to, at some point, sort of what I describe as get on your horse and ride. You basically say, damn the torpedoes, we're going to do this, we're going to do it now, as long as it takes, we're going to get a result. Is it easier to be minority leader? Sure, piece of cake. Yeah. Uh, maybe Bob Dole and Howard Baker and uh, Everett Dirksen and their years in the minority, built the rules to their benefit, which, by the way, when you become the majority, works against you. I've got to go. Jason, one last question. All right. Very quick question. I have a confession to make. I wrote Bob Dole's speech at the Strom Thurmond event. Uh, and you write in the book, when I read the book, I thought this is exactly what I thought was going on, that there was a little bit of a competition uh, at, at play there. That uh, Dole got up and he did his oh, thing yeah, yeah. and did all the jokes and everything right. else. And then and you found yourself following Dole. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, that, was that the dynamic of what was well, going on? Well, in a way, but you know, that's, uh, that's sort of like horses in a you know, run with the roses. Uh, you know, when the competition begins, uh, it's me a you know, a successful politician, you got to have a little bit of a ham in you. When one guy gets up and, and you know, really gets the crowd going and laughing, then you say, hey, I, it was unbelievable. I got to top that. And then you go over the top. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I really appreciate it.